everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk here in studio. It's an honor to introduce our mayor again, Mayor Jerry Dehovic. How are you? How's it going as mayor? Thank you, Liz. Doing great. Uh, you know, being mayor, like I say every time, is a wonderful job. One of the best jobs in the city. Keeping you busy. Keeping me busy. And the life in uh, RPV is, we're doing quite well. You know, across the board, we, you know, Susan Brooks coined the phrase, we paradise. live in paradise, but you know, we, we all say it and you know it and I know it and every resident I believe uh, knows it right. too. So. Exciting news. We always start by talking about public safety and uh, SafeWise just ranked RPV as the seventh safest city in California and last year we were eighth, so we're, we keep moving on up. We were eighth, yeah, and it's, it's, it's great recognition. I have a couple stats at my fingertips, you know, uh, they call them part one crimes. Those are residential burglaries, which are probably the biggest thing that we worry about, and then uh, vehicle thefts and vehicle uh, thefts from vehicles. Um, burglaries are down 16% year over year, and vehicle thefts are down 36%. So those are huge numbers. And, you know, the residents should know that, that RPV is one of the safest cities out there, and we rank very, very well uh, versus other cities in the state of California and nationally. So we're, we're doing a good job. Right, and I know it's one of your goals, we mentioned this last show, is to continue to reduce the numbers of crime that we have here. So what more could can we do as a city and the Sheriff's Department working together? I'm going to recap what we've done as a city because we, we, we spent probably well over $3 million uh, in the last four years, you know, 2015 was a high point with respect to crime, and uh, we, we hired two additional RPV only uh, deputies. We have a dedicated Southside deputy we're installing, along with the other cities, all the AOPRs around the entire peninsula, uh, hired a SAT detective. So we're doing, what residents can do is try and harden the targets. Don't leave stuff in your car. Believe it or not, one of the areas that we did increase was thefts from unlocked vehicles. Okay. Someone reports something stolen and they go back and look, well, there's no visible sign of breaking. You must have left it unlocked. Right. So lock your doors, lock, lock your, your cars. Lock your doors. Don't, if you don't want it gone, don't leave it on your front seat or in your car. Exactly. Put it in your trunk. And uh, as we always keep saying, if you see something, say something. That's a really big piece is That's neighborhood a huge involvement. Piece. Right? Absolutely. Get to know your neighbors. Tell them, you know, you're going to be gone or keep an eye out on my house, whatever it might be. Okay. Yeah. And I know we were talking earlier, too, about... Uh, uh, Doug Shive, uh, Sergeant Shive, since we're talking about law enforcement in the community with the Sheriff's Absolutely. Department, he's well, going to be departing, yes? He's departing. He's actually retiring, which okay. is good for him. And there's a lot, unfortunately, a lot of sheriffs are retiring. We have a little bit of a downturn in applicants there. Right. But uh, on behalf of the city and the staff and everyone, I just want to say thank you to Doug Shive. He's done a great job. He was our core detective. He's our primary contact. He went out and visited and spoke and taught and all these different things. And you know, he was loved within the community. So it's a loss, but we're happy to welcome Tina McCoy, mm -hmm. who was at our meeting last night. And uh, I'm looking forward to good things from her. But Doug did a great job, and we wish him well. Yeah, I was telling you that we were, he was in our neighborhood of Seaview um, with Sergeant Tina McCoy, working on training and showing her about doing home audits, safe, safe home safety audits, which the sheriff offers that free service. So and I come, heard you did well. Yeah, <laughs> they came to my house and uh, just to tell me what I needed to do a better job at to protect my house. And uh, so it was it was interesting to see. And so it'll be great to, to work with her. And as Doug was always um, working with the volunteers in the community too, just to get involved. And, Absolutely, and again, very well liked yeah. and respected. So. so we're going to look at you. You're busy. In fact, I know when you leave here from this, you're going to go to CHOA to the Council of Homeowners uh, meeting. That's so right. You're, you're, you're a, man on the, a mayor on the go. <laughs> Two meetings, of course, in the month of March and a city budget workshop. Absolutely. So I thought we could start with a budget workshop, talk about the money. Well, What's yeah, going on? Let's do that. You know, that's, it's so funny. Um, I don't know who, who said it, but many years ago, that's probably one of the most important things we do next to public safety and infrastructure is managing right. the city's money. Right. And that's always the, the, the most uh, thinly attended meeting, if you will. And it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's all not that exciting. It's not that exciting when you're going through all this stuff. But, you know, our first meeting, what we do is uh, we take a look at our general fund and the revenues versus expenditures. And staff takes a preliminary stab at putting together a budget. We actually do it over the course of three or four meetings, and we will approve a budget in June. Our next next meeting on the budget topic is on May 21st, if anyone's interested. Mm -hmm. um, but we look at expenditures. We look at, at, at modifying the fiscal year 18-19. Uh, do we need to uh, adjust our estimates, which we do? Then we also look at the five-year model, which is projecting five years out what's going on with the city. We need to be forward-looking and forward-thinking because... Uh, you know, the money's just not falling off the trees. So 
that's one of the biggest things um, that we look at. And, and again, the city's in great financial shape, I have to say. And most of that is due to Terranea. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if you know the number. They've, uh, they've, they've paid the city in transient occupancy tax over $60 million since they've been open. And that's and this, a lot of money. And this is their 10-year anniversary. This is their 10. So 10 years, 60 million, you figure it out roughly. It's, yeah. uh, it's, they, they do a great job down there. And we're very happy about that. And that does make our budgeting a little bit easier. Right. Um, but but this council is very proactive. I'm very proud of our record on what we've done financially and, you know, increasing the spending where, where we need to and uh, being vigilant where we can watch expenses. But we actually proactively asked staff to go back and really think, what can we do to cut expenditures? And that I mean, nothing is a sacred cow out there. We have to look at staff, look at this. Look at, we mm -hmm. want to see everything because... You know, they're, they're, the economy is cyclical like everything else, right. so we need to prepare for that. So in terms of the like the economic for, forecast for Terranea, do you have any feel for that? I mean, such being such we an do. important piece. We do. You know, they, they, they do a great job in providing us the numbers, but it, it's interesting that their numbers look flat for the next five years, and that's based on input from them, and they give us annual indications on what's looking and what the long-term bookings, because, you know, as you might imagine, they book way in advance mm -hmm. when you have these big, huge... Uh, uh, conferences and weddings and stuff there. So it, it, we're budgeting on the conservative side, which is flat for the next five years. Right. But overall, the general budget compared to last year, do you have any idea where it is in the ballpark? And uh, it's it's about the same. You know, there might be a little bit of increase, but uh, again, we're managing it. And we, I think, uh, I'm, I'm counting on staff to come back for this budget cycle. I'm, I'm looking a for a significant, uh, hopefully, decrease in the proposed budget. Okay. So. Now, the city council at your last meeting, which was yesterday, well, yesterday as, as, as of our filming on March nineteenth, right. you <laughs> had the um, you picked a new selected a new appointee for the FAC for the financial advisory committee because you had a you had a vacancy. We had a vacancy, that's and right. so uh, congratulations to is it Raquel? Raquel Brown. Brown? You're right. Yeah. Yep. And she, so I'm bringing that up only because uh, how does how does the finance committee play into the budget process? Well, that we have a very uh, astute group there with uh, financial acumen and again I have to say all, all our committees are stellar but this particular group is is uh, so well educated and 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 experienced in this particular arena we asked them to take a look at all the budget numbers staff goes to them first before we see anything it runs it by them does a dry run um, looks at the numbers comes back makes suggestions not only on the budget uh, but our five-year model and and saying what's what's prudent and what's not and a lot of those individuals have significant expertise in that arena with forecasting. The other thing that we do too, and this is something that, that this council has worked hard on too, is to make this a much more collaborative process. In the old days, we used to have a work plan and we told the fact, here's your work plan. You're not to deviate. Don't mm -hmm. come forward with suggestions. You can make suggestions on the topics, but now we ask them, bring your ideas forward. And that's for all committees. So that's, that's another big thing that, uh, has changed the dynamic. So. so they're an important part of that process. Absolutely. Very, very important for me, and I know for the rest of my colleagues, what they have to say carries a lot of weight. So uh, for our members of the community, the residents who want to get involved in the budget process, they can also go onto our city website. And Absolutely. There's, there's a document there in progress to kind of write, to check Absolutely. out. Absolutely. It's RPVC. there, and they can come to the meetings. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. No, 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 you. you're go not ahead. at all. No, so so that's that's good. So we'll, we'll you'll keep us posted on that. because We still will. Got, a few more meetings before you'll finalize this. That's correct. And no more budget workshops, did you say? That? Uh, we have a CIP workshop. Okay. So we're going to start looking at infrastructure problems, capital improvement projects, and uh, that's a big part of our expenditures too. And we have to prioritize, and we have the IMAC, the Infrastructure so a, Management Advisory Committee, to guide us along that path also. So that the CIP, as you call it, the Capital Improvement Plan Pro Pro projects. Pro projects. Yeah. That's that's budgeted separately. That works different. How do you know? Well, for the, people the watching project, the budget it's all process. part of the budget, and we look at it. We we it's part of the budget, but it's a major component in the budget. Right. You know, staff costs, oh. CIP, law enforcement. Got it. Yeah. All right, keeping you busy on that. Yep. So moving on to uh, we ta always take a look in this show at sort of the big action items, the agenda items that come before the city council that you vote on or may decide on and. Green Hills Memorial Park was uh, a big item addressed at the March 19th meeting. Correct. You did the annual review of the Green Hills, how they're complying with the conditions of approval for their permit. Exactly. <laughs> so explain all that. And so for people watching what you had to do reviewing Green Hills, what was going on there? Well, there, there are certain conditions and, you know, conditions, uh, um, 
conditional use permit, per the conditional use permit, there are various specifics that they have to comply with. And as part of their conditional use permit, there is a requirement for an annual review. And the council has undertaken that. I think we took over that about three years ago. I won't bore you the details why. Um, but we do that annual review now, and there are, there are action conditions and there are other conditions operational. So we take a look at all of those to make sure they're being complied with, those that, that necessitate an ongoing review. Some of them come to, to completion. For example, uh, a fence along the northern border between Peninsula Verde and the cemetery. Well, that's completed now, so that's checked off the box and won't be on our next year's review. Uh, but we went through in great detail the action items and the operational items. So. Right. Of course, when Green Hills comes before the council, we all know for years there's been some controversy attached with the park. There's been litigation, et cetera. So That's how do you true. sift through all that as you're processing, you know, you have members of the community that have come forward that are, you know. Yeah, there, there, unfortunately, there was there were some mistakes made several years ago, and there's, there's a uh, group that has been um, – disadvantaged and there's their their situation is not that great you know the city's already settled with them there's other right. ongoing litigation and as you might imagine they have a different interpretation than than the city does with respect to how we read our ordinances and rules and master plans etc right. so they came forward and they spoke about that and we we take all that into consideration but uh but I that's separate from what totally yeah. separate and they they try to bring it for they bring it forward every meeting so right right and I know one thing that I saw as watching the meeting, what seemed to come out uh, across is that, that Green Hill seems to certainly be making a lot of efforts and improvements in working with the public in general. You, you know, know, it's, it's funny and you say that. We have basically a whole new management team. It's the sons of the individuals that own and ran it previously. And uh, they do a great job. They are totally receptive. They're, they're cutting edge. There's a lot of energy and enthusiasm there. And they've listened to what we told them. I don't know if you saw the meeting, but no, there was, yeah. I gave them some specific points after the fact saying we're not going to make this part of the uh, conditions of approval, but you need to consider this stuff. And they were very receptive and to that. And obviously Green Hills Borough Park has, has been an important neighbor in our community since before the city even incorporated. 70 years plus, right? I think. So they, yeah. Yeah. They, they do a good job and they're listening. So Okay. Well, so, well, so then, so you got through that process that went I think so yeah they we, we approve that they are in compliance so. okay um, obviously every meeting you take you have a consent calendar items that come up of importance mm -hmm. one of them that uh, was at the March 19th meeting had to do with um, a partnership or an agreement that you have with the school district and the city regarding sharing resources for uh, recreation correct so and I know this started way back in two, uh, 2011 through you that's right explain what's going on there well 2011 I you know there was a lot of stuff going on back then and primarily it was Marymount wanted to create a big field in a very bad uh, location as far as I was concerned so we try to think collectively how we can address this and this was partnering partnering with the uh, school district having them let us use the city and Marymount use the uh, fields at Merrill Last. And that morphed into allowing us to use the gymnasium, not only at Merrillas, but at Penn High and the pool at Penn High. And that was, there was a little quid pro quo there. We, we donated $80,000 towards the construction of the pool because, you know, there are residents there and the students. Um, so part of that was they allowed us to use the pool. That was not part of this particular deal here. Um, but it's still going to be looked at because, you know, the, the, the school district is in need of funds at all times, you know, enrollment shrunk. So... Um, they're thinking about maybe they can monetize the use of that pool through leasing it to some leagues, and we'll see where that goes. But an interesting note, we started in 2011 uh, with 62 individuals using the gymnasium. And this well, is the gym at Miralast. That's right. Where my and, kids went. Yep, yeah, and now we have the gym at Miralast and Penn, and over the last two years it's over 1,500 individuals wow. using it. So that's a good number, so it's a good program, and the staff administers and provides supervision and security and clean up and all that good stuff so the city works hard at that example of it takes a village it's nice that you could share those resources well that, that absolutely yeah. so well excellent about that um we're going to go back to the first meeting in march mm -hmm. uh you it was a long meeting right you guys had a lot going on that we meeting. did <laughs> finished right at 11 o'clock yeah that okay. was good yeah you Started had a lot, 5 30 lot. to 11 you had so a lot you have, we have a lot of good things going on in the city to address um, you had like, a few public hearings. The first uh, was resulted in the council passing an ordinance that deals with neighborhood compa compatibility. Compatibility, spit that out, yes. Correct. Yeah, that really had to do with the AD ish ADU issue, auxiliary dwelling units, and that we think we talked about a little more in depth at our last meeting. But uh, the, the process of an ordinance going through is it's first introduced at the first reading, and then the second reading, it's adopted and approved by by the council. 
And that's what happened there. And that has to do with, you know, the granny flats or secondary units or ADUs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, we really had to tighten up our ordinances in order to ensure that, that we didn't have monstrosities built on people's property and to comply um, with our codes and neighborhood compatibility and what have you. So okay. that's what we did. Good. Uh, the council also got a very important presentation about wildfire prevention uh, from, the Cal from California, from S Southern California Edison. And I just wanted what you thought the takeaways from the presentation. Obviously, we've seen the devastation of wildfires in our state, and mm -hmm. so we're on it here in our own community. Um, you know, how I want to know how ready you think RPV is if a wildfire were to strike. And again, to go back to that presentation, how well, it we ties are, in. Yeah, we are in a high fire zone, as you know, and, and thank God we haven't had a, a large fire for for a number of years now. I think going back to 09, maybe 2010. But it's uh, it's we, we have a high fire risk here, and especially now with all the rain, we have all this beautiful growth that's green, and in very short order, it's going to turn yellow and become very combustible. Um, but the good news is at Southern California Edison, we have a new cadre of folks that are dedicated to RPV. Uh, we had a, a, a decent relationship with the prior group, but, but this group has um, committed to a much better relationship, and we're looking forward to that. And they started off with a bang with us. First of all, they came and presented to us to begin right. with, number one. Uh, but they picked up on a couple different major points for us. Number one... Uh, is to ensure resiliency. You know, we had, if you remember way back when, Liz, too, we used to have a lot of power outages, and that had to do with faulty equipment, old equipment, uh, breakdowns, and what have you. So our, the resiliency and the, the uh, ability to have constant power, that's, that's come a long way. Along with that is preventing fires. And part of that is what they call hardening, all the apparatus and hardware, Everything from, they, they showed at the meeting, I don't know if you saw it, they, they actually showed the wires. These are now coated mm -hmm. so they don't exude, you know, electrical shocks and sparks and all that if, in fact, they do fall. Uh, move, removing foliage around the different poles, not only in the open space, but actually on people's private homes, too. I think I told you, I mentioned to you, they actually came to my house and said, your palm trees are... Uh, getting awful close to that line. Do you mind if we trim them? And I said, right. go ahead. So they're, they're very, the actual Southern California Edison statewide has projected to spend about $100 million trimming trees right, I was to cut down on fires. Not only, obviously not an RPV alone, but statewide. So it's, they're taking a very proactive approach. You know, there's this whole issue about uh, utilities and litigation and liability. So they, they have to be proactive. Right, because I was I think there's been quite a few wildfires that have been started from either down lines or things like that, so uh, sparking the fires. Absolutely, and you have the uh, um, near-term issues that they can fix very quickly and longer term, such as undergrounding. We'd really like to see all the, uh, all the uh, uh, above ground cabling and wires underground, and that may or may not happen. It's very, very expensive. So yes. we've got short-term mitigation issues and long-term, and that's one of the longer ones. But this city RPV, you feel, is, is ready, as ready as you can be? And you uh, can you always know, do more. I think, I think we're ready. Um, you know, hopefully it doesn't, doesn't come to that situation. But, you know, we really do count on Southern California Edison to do their part. All, and and uh, in the past, some of that was questionable on some of the older equipment. But they've done a good job. They've stepped up. I don't want to besmirch them at all. I think, you know, we're mm -hmm. working hand-in-hand -hand to try and make sure we don't have a problem. Okay. Um, Moving on, Ladera Linda Playing Fields came up again at your March 5th council meeting. Uh, just it what's did. the latest going on? Well, you know, in, in the spirit of transparency and actually in the, uh, you know, with respect to the open meeting laws, we had to designate a negotiator, a quote-unquote negotiator. Uh, we selected Doug Wilmore, the city manager, and the uh, school district uh, selected their superintendent. And this is really more of a fact-finding adventure at this point. We want right. to find out if there's any interest in, in relinquishing control on the part of the school district. Do we have, I'm sorry, go I ahead. I mean, because right now the school district leases those fields to AYSO. Basically, that's the, the full usage there, and AYSO controls it, and we don't have a problem with that. And I know there was some concern about why is the city interested in taking over these fields? You're going to give a, AYSO the boot, and that's not the case. Uh, we don't want to build anything there. And actually, if there were to be any deal, there would be something built into the contract where if the school district wanted it back, that we would accommodate them on that because, you know, demographics change and gentrification and what have you. That was originally designed to be a, a school at some point, school property. So you never know. They might need it in the future. They may not. Uh, no, no ill intentions here at all. There, there may be a way that the city, for a very small amount of money, can take that burden from the school district mm -hmm. uh, and control what goes on over there to a certain extent because that's what our residents 
really expect and thought was actually transpiring when it really wasn't. All right, so. and of course, when we go back with the fields was when there was some issue of whether there was soil contamination or not, and that's so, because I was saying, why in the end would, it, would, would the city need to basically be in charge of those fields? And that's exactly right, and it, it has to do with control and enforcing what goes on back there, and you know, the school district is limiting what they can do, and we're there, and we're hopefully about to move forward with the Ladera Linda Community Center there, and that can all tie in and so it, it, it may be a good thing. We'll see. Okay. But I can tell you personally, I'm not interested in spending a whole lot of money there. All right. So they'll, when will we hear the, about this once, you know, our city manager is going to... Yeah, they're going to talk and informally and kind of see where they are and what the AYSO lease calls for. And okay. uh, again, when they bring it back and say, this is what they're proposing, this is what they want, or this is what they will accept or not accept, the council will weigh that and move forward. All right. Well, since we're talking about outdoor activity, when we talk about Ladera Linda Fields, we'll move on to night hikes. Uh huh. Since that is, uh, so the city council has adopted a, revi a revised night hike policy yep. um, in the Palos Verdes Preserve. Will you just give us an overview of how this policy works and sort of, again, why you needed to sort of revise it? You know, we, there, there, was an, there was an outcry uh, from residents around the perimeter of the preserve, and it wasn't just at Del Cerro, but there was people out there hiking at night, and it was... It, it was fairly unmanaged. There was a policy in place, you know, staff worked to, to police it, uh, but it needed to be readdressed. Some residents were looking for relief. So basically the bottom line is what we adopted was there are uh, night hikes allowed, only four per month, the months of October through February, no more than 20 hikers. They have to apply for a permit that'll be vetted by staff who's doing it. And the biggest thing is it has to be uh, led by either a city staff person who's trained, uh, a conservancy employee who's been trained, or another individual who's certified to do that. Okay. So we really want to control it. They got to be out of there by nine o'clock. Um, the way this works is is the idea is you, you don't want to disturb the neighbors and you also want to preserve the preserve, you know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. they don't want people going out there and, and partying at night. And some of that went on, but it's it's become a lot better, and, and we're going to get better with some gating and stuff going on. So okay. And Del Cerro, uh, I'm going to thank the Del Cerro neighbors and the uh, uh, Sierra Club, and and actually the Conservancy and staff for putting together a very viable and, and acceptable plan. Because originally I wanted to cancel them all, just <laughs> with all candor here, but. Uh, I came around, and I think with these these finer points, I think we can live with it, and I think it'll be good. And we can always change that at any given time. So. All right. Well, a big, big accomplishment for the city council was you basically adopted revised goals and an action plan for 2019. We did. Uh, and you and I went, or I think at one of our last shows, we actually went through those goals. But overall, just as you look over the process, how it all went, I just wanted, as mayor, were you pleased with the result of working with staff in the community to come up with these revised goals. You know, I, I couldn't And be, an action plan. Couldn't, couldn't be more thrilled, Liz, I'm gonna tell you. Uh, hats off to uh, Councilman Dida, City Founder Dida, former Mayor Dida, and Councilman Alegria for working very, very hard. You don't realize how many hours goes in. I do, but a lot of people don't. Uh, and staff, Doug Wilmore and the entire senior staff that worked very hard, Gabby putting all this stuff together. Um, I was, I was pretty adamant up front about not losing what we did in the past. We spent an awful lot of time in 14 when we went through this exercise, and we've kept the core goals. Uh, it's a much cleaner presentation now. Uh, the, the action items are current. They're smart. You know, basically you have the, the uh, uh, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and uh, what's the last one? Timely. Um, we kind of try to implement that in every goal. So it's a, it's a great roadmap going forward. And the way we categorized all the different categories and, and uh, uh, projects and, and move things around, I, I just couldn't be happier, to be honest with you. Right. Well, you've been on this council. This is your eighth year. Eighth year. It's crazy. So as you sort of, as it, and what what's on your bucket list as we continue to move forward? I mean, we're only in the springtime, so you've got some time. We're in the here. spring. You know, I, one hard. of the things I did when I was mayor way back when, and I actually talked to the deputy city manager, I want to bring back the uh, kind of the heroes among us recognition. It was just shocking uh, the, the level and quality of people that have, that were actually heroes, and you really don't know about it. You know, we had in our own neighborhood, we had Marta was, you know, a double agent during World War II right. and, you know, working I for, like that. yeah, it was just, and then we had uh, a gentleman that flew, you know, 128 missions bombing, it's just people that you would, you know, they're your neighbor and you don't even know. So I want to recognize those people. I come from a little bit of a military background, so they don't necessarily have to be military, but we want to recognize some heroes. So that's something I'm going to resurrect at some point in the not too distant future. 
Uh, the other big thing is, and this is difficult to do, is ensuring continuity. And this leads me to one of the things I was going to bring up later. We have an election this year. And I just saw the posting in the newsletter saying, hey, if you're interested, you know, get out there. The, uh, the window opens in June or July closes in June to August to apply. And uh, we may have a council that basically has two years or less experience in very short order, not knowing who's going to run. Right, so. right. So because you'll have three of you are terming out. Well, actually, three of us are, two of us are terming out, oh, yeah. Councilwoman Brooks and I, and Councilman Dighty can run again, and, and I, it'll be interesting to see if he runs. Okay. So, and then, uh, so then, yeah, then you'll, you know, you'll have Eric Mayor and Pro John, Tem, the Mayor right? Pro Tem, John Crookshank and Eric, yeah. um, they'll have, they've just been on for the year. So that'll be, be that'll be two, two years yeah, by two the years. end of that time when the election rolls around. And I said it earlier in our first, uh, uh, first show here, one of my big things is to make sure we don't lose all that institutional knowledge and hard work because it's very easy to do. Right. And actually, Councilman, uh, actually Mayor Pro Tem Crookshank commented last night, he said, boy, that stuff flows off your tongue pretty easily. And it's like. Well, that's because you've been. I've been doing it for seven years. And so, so since we're, we, we have a few minutes left, but I'm yeah. back. But this is really important that we can encourage members of the community in terms of, you know, I mean, you don't have have to have volunteered yet for the city. It's important. Like there's sort of this unsaid thing. I think well, you should serve on the planning commission first or something like that before. It used you went to be the council. unwritten rule. That Do was. Do you think that that's still the case? I mean, no. I just I think that being on a committee does help because you just by osmosis you kind of figure out how things work. But you can study it. We also have our leadership academy that the city's done a great job on, and that was very well attended. Mm -hmm. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be on a committee or commission, but it does help a little bit if you can. You get you get to know the people. You get to be known in the community. You kind of see how city government works, but it's not a prerequisite by any stretch. All right. So think so get about out that. there. Yeah, absolutely. We need good candidates and good people to run. And speaking of good people and also a hero, I have to mention this. We have a few minutes left. Your daughter, Gina Dehovic. Uh, I'm going to plug her because she's here as our, our, our RPV TV intern. And uh, because you're thinking about people that serve our community, volunteers, she gave a thousand service hours plus and got yeah, recognized by your archdiocese. Absolutely, congratulations! Yeah. Thank you good, so much. Good it dad, was, good daughter, well, good she, mama. She, yeah, uh, my my wife really was <laughs> Great, much more say. involved than I was. I, I did participate quite a bit, but I think she was closer to 1,200 hours, and she was recognized as one of 70 students in the entire archdiocese for for her community service and leadership and involvement. So. It was a big to-do yesterday, and the whole family went down. We dragged my mother out, the principal, and the, the cathedral was full in downtown L.A. Well, it's so. great that you start start young and learn about the importance of volunteering and giving back to the community. And and the good news is, is that, well, thank you for that, but the good news is it was always a family event, and there was a lot of friends involved, too. Mm -hmm. so she worked individually quite a bit, but there was usually groups associated with Well, this, she's so. been great here helping us. We're bringing her to Whale of a Day to assist our RPV TV crew. Of course, that's April 13th. My family and I have been <laughs> going there since they were since they were very small, and they always love going, and we have a good time. We drag their friends with us, and it's, yeah. it's it's a great it's a great day it's All a great right. day and we've got a couple new exhibits opening we get to dedicate that yeah that's i get to big. lead that that's going to be exciting i know there's going to be great the uh fresnel lens we're going we're going to say that this time <laughs> uh the lighthouse donated the fresnel lens to yep. our city and it's now going to be an exhibit yep. Um, it's phenomenal. I was there when they were dismantling it. It was it was and pretty special. And you actually special. recorded a video with we the did. whole process, we, yes, right? That's we awesome. Did. I we can't did. wait to see that. And um, Jeff Coven, who was our, our videographer that works mm -hmm. with us, he did he did days in, and it was interesting because they the way they take it apart. Sure. And we had one of the last lampists right. in the, in the country that does this for the Coast Guard because they're replacing them now all with the LEDs. It's amazing. So and then of course the other exhibits about whaling. So it's going to be really fun. You, I mean, Point Vicente Interpretive Center is an incredible it really educational is. tool and jewel for our community. And resource and venue for, for events, too, yeah. right on that patio. is great. So I'll be seeing it whale of a day. We'll see who spots the whale first. Yeah, well, hopefully there'll be they'll several be northbound. out there. They will be. And we have, we have had a couple good years since moving it a little bit later in the year. I do want to wish you a very happy belated birthday. It was yesterday. You kind of stole my thunder because I'll, I didn't call you yesterday because I wanted to do it in the beginning of the show, but you said, oh, it was my birthday yesterday. Yeah. But anyway, very I'm, happy I birthday I appreciate you had a city council meeting. I watched the city council meeting on my birthday, but, you know, it was... It's, you were on my list, and I said, well, I'm so filming much. tomorrow. I kind of wanted to embarrass you, but that's well, okay. And you. I was thinking about singing to you, but I don't want to have everyone turn off their TVs and <laughs> computers here. Well, I, so. I, I feel very grateful and uh, I had many I, happy returns yeah, and many more you. birthdays and thank you for all that you do. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's great to celebrate here in it's our It's tough PV. to be 29, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it for this edition of RPV City Talk with Mayor Jerry Dehovic. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. See you next time. Thanks for joining us.